Good morning, everyone, and, and good evening to our Asia colleagues. Um, a very warm welcome to you all, and, and thank you for joining us for, for this Trust Conference panel. It's, it's great to have you with us. I'm Zoe Tabri. I'm the tech editor at the Thomson Reuters Foundation, and I'm delighted to be your host today. So we've discussed over the past day or so the growing threat posed by runaway climate change, the business case for inclusive economies, rising attacks against media freedom, and now we're going to delve into another of one of the biggest issues of our time over the next three panels, technology's impact on society, and more specifically, growing threats to digital rights. One of these, of course, being encryption and how new laws and regulations from around the world are threatening to weaken encryption, with law enforcement claiming that access to private communications is needed to catch criminals online. Yet, as we're going to see with our panel, encryption, and particularly end-to-end -end encryption, play a critical role in protecting our day-to-day -day digital activities. We're going to examine what encryption policy looks like around the world, but crucially, what government efforts to weaken encryption would mean for vulnerable communities like LGBT plus groups, their advocacy, and for society in general. I'm joined by a terrific panel to discuss those issues today. Callum Vogie, who's Government Affairs and Policy Manager in the Internet Society, and thank you very much to the Internet Society for supporting this session. Lillian Alwoga, who's Program Manager for the Collaboration on International ICT Policy in East and Southern Africa, and Scott Griffin, who's Deputy Director for the International Press Institute. I'll hand over to each one of them for some opening remarks, and then we'll have a discussion for about 45 minutes or so, which should take us to just about an hour. Do, as ever, feel free to tweet using hashtag TC2021. And as a reminder to those just joining us in, in the interest of transparency, I should add that today's session is being recorded and you can find the link on the website afterwards. Callum, if I could come to you first, to set the scene a little bit for us, could you break down what encryption really is, how it works, and give us an overview of encryption policy around the world? Yeah, sure. Um, happy to do that. Hello, everyone. Um, as Zoe said, my name's Callum Vogi, and I'm the Government Affairs and Advocacy, Advocacy Manager at the Internet Society. And as you'll have seen in the video from my colleague Vinalia, the Internet Society is one of the sponsors uh, of this conference. We're incredibly proud to be involved in such an impactful event. So thanks. Thanks a lot for having us. Uh, as a brief introduction, the Internet Society is a global nonprofit organization. It works to ensure that the internet, internet remains a force for good for everyone. Um, we were founded in 1992 by the Internet's pioneers and are joined by a community of members, special interest groups, and over 130 chapters uh, around the world. Uh, what we do is we defend and promote uh, Internet policy standards and protocols that keep the Internet open, globally connected, secure, and uh, very appropriate for this conference, uh, trustworthy. Uh, encryption is one of the projects that I personally work on, so I'm, I'm really happy to be able to join today. So the first question, what actually is encryption? Uh, we all use it in our everyday lives, whether we're sending a WhatsApp message, receiving an email or transferring money through the bank, uh, but what exactly is it? Uh, in its simplest form, encryption is the process of scrambling information so that it can only be read by someone who has the keys to, to unscramble it. And the analogy that I like to use is that of a postcard. So when you send a message without encryption, it's like sending a postcard. Uh, anyone that the, uh, the postcard sorry, passes through will not only be able to read the message that I've written, We'll also be able to modify the message, you know, maybe crossing out certain words or adding additional sentences. Um, postcards are not secure, and that's when I send why when I send one to my mom, I don't include any sensitive information like my ID number or my bank account. Um, sending a message with encryption, we can actually use the same metaphor. So let's say I've sent an, an encrypted message to Zoe. Uh, imagine that same postcard being sent, but only this time it's in a secret language that is unintelligible to anyone other than Zoe and myself. Um, the technical term for that scrambled message is uh, ciphertext. Um, when Zoe finally receives that postcard, uh, she uses a key that only she, only she possesses to translate that ciphertext back into its original form, which is something we call clear text. Um, so by sending a message with encryption, I have the added security of knowing that Zoe will be, uh, that only Zoe will be able to read what I've sent. Uh, I cannot send inf information that's sensitive, with a lot more confidence. And I know that no one will be able to tamper with my message without Zoe and myself uh, realizing that. So I hope that uh, metaphor is useful. Uh, it describes in, uh, encryption for data in transit, but actually the same principles can be applied for data at rest. So for when you uh, store important documents uh, online. 
And I think the, the main message to take away here is that uh, encryption secures data. And it, it does this in a few ways. So it ensures that the data is confidential. No one can read the secret language on the postcard except for Zoe and myself. Uh, it promises data integrity. So no one can alter or manipulate the postcard without Zoe realizing it. And it provides authentication. So Zoe knows that the message really has come from me uh, as no one else speaks that language that the postcard is written in. Um, and then I think an important thing to stress here, and Zoe's already alluded to this, is that um, when it comes to data in transit, not all encryption is created equal. And I'm sure a lot of us will have heard of something called end-to-end uh, -end encryption. End-to-end um, -end encryption, like the name suggests, it means that sent data is protected from encryption from, from start to finish or from, from one endpoint uh, to the other endpoint. Um, the message that I write is encrypted on my device before it's sent, and then it is decrypted on the recipient's uh, device. So at all of the moments when the message is moving or the data is moving, it's, it's scrambled and it can't be, can't be read. Um, this contrasts a lot to what we call channel encryption. Um, the difference here is that the service provider at certain moments handles my decrypted data, the, the clear text data. So with channel encryption, there are actually three parties that can read the message. It's myself, the recipient, and the service provider. So that would be the, the difference between channel encryption and end-to-end -end encryption. Um, when we talk about strong encryption, usually we're talking about end-to-end -end encryption. That's really like the gold standard uh, in the industry. Uh, and then the second part of your question, Zoe, it's uh, where is encryption being threatened and, and why is it being threatened? So um, be encryption is being threatened around the world in the name of increasing internet safety. Uh, as you said, the charge is mostly being led by law enforcement agencies. Uh, they're calling for access to our private communications to combat child sexual abuse material, terrorist activities, and also uh, disinformation. Those would be the three big uh, topics. Uh, their argument is that encryption makes it more difficult for them to track criminal activity on the internet. Uh, countries are taking legislative action against encryption in, in different ways. There's no kind of one set formula, but the shared theme is that service providers are being pressured uh, to grant law enforcement access to encrypted data. Um, the problem here is that there's currently no technical solution for service providers, service providers to do this without undermining security and privacy for, for everyone. Um, Basically, we can divide the approaches that countries are taking into two um, general buckets. Uh, so in the first bucket of countries, um, they're specifically targeting our private messaging. And they, they do this by placing obligations on service providers to grant access to our private data through something called technical uh, capability notices. Uh, so in simple terms, a technical capability notice requires a service provider to have the technical means to hand over uh, decrypted content uh, whenever it's needed by law enforcement uh, agencies. And I can provide a few examples for this. So the first would be the, the UK's online safety bill. This is kind of leading legislation around the world. Um, it's going to place a duty of care on digital providers to protect um, users from illegal and harmful content online. And to be compliant with this duty of care, providers will need to have the ability to provide law enforcement uh, access to the decrypted private messages um, when needed. Um, elsewhere, for example, in India, they have something called the Incoming Intermediary Liabilities Guidelines, which would make immunity from intermediary liability conditional on satisfying certain requirements, such as monitoring content and providing message traceability for private messages. So that's kind of more of like a carrot approach. Uh, if you look across to Brazil, uh, in Brazil in recent years, there were several high profile legal cases where internet service providers were ordered to block WhatsApp in the country because Facebook had failed to hand over uh, decrypted data. Um, like in India, the concept of traceability is still under discussion in Brazil's draft uh, disinformation bill. And uh, with all of these examples, we actually don't see encryption mentioned explicitly in the text of any of the bills. Uh, instead, legislation places an onus on service providers to find what they call technical solutions for accessing private messages without breaking end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, the only problem here is that these technical solutions do not currently exist. You can't have access and have end-to-end -end encryption at the same time. So service providers are therefore being pushed into a corner where they're forced to either stop offering encryption entirely, or they need to offer a weakened version of encryption that has been re-engineered to create what they call encryption backdoors for, for government access. So uh, that was the first kind of bucket of countries. The second bucket of countries, they seek to decrypt not just our private messages, but decrypt websites in general. So you might know that when you type a URL into your browser, into your browser, sorry, you'll notice that it typically starts with HTTPS. Um, the S in HTTPS actually stands for secure, and that means that the website is encrypted and the data uh, protected. Uh, over 80% of websites in the world have HTTPS protection, which is which is a really great thing. 
Um, but if we look at the countries, for example, so we can look at Kazakhstan and Mauritius, um, both countries sought to pass legislation that would place government agencies in between users and websites so that all incoming traffic in the country would have to be decrypted and subject to government uh, analysis and filtering before users would be able to access those websites. Uh, that approach of decrypting traffic to websites is extremely concerning, I would say, as it would mean that government access uh, is given to a whole range of data, not only our private messages, but also our banking details, our passwords for all the websites we access. Um, there's a lot more kind of potential for, for abuse there. So kind of in summary, uh, you'll find new attacks on encryption all over the world, but you'll very seldom see the word encryption mentioned explicitly. Um, instead, countries are creating conditions that will indirectly result in the loss of uh, encryption. And I would say, you know, given the audience of this conference, journalists and civil society play a really key role in all of this when it comes to keeping the public informed. Um, the public will often get behind efforts to protect children or, or stop terrorist content, uh, ter sorry, terrorist messaging on the internet. But they, what they really need to be aware of is what they're losing in return. Uh, so that, you know, that's their privacy and security against the very people that these laws are supposedly uh, trying to stop. Uh, so I'll end there. Thanks, Callum. That's an extremely helpful overview, and we'll uh, we'll come on in a minute to threats against specific groups. I really like your postcard analogy, which which I think highlights the extent to which threats to digital rights, rather than just targeting a very specific or highly tech savvy group of people, has implications for for everyday lives. Um, you know, you've touched on encryption, um, threats to encryption being carried out in, in the name of internet safety. Um, but also countries taking legislative actions and, and kind of forcing service providers into a corner. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute as well. Um, Lillian, if I could come to you, I would love to hear as, as an expert on digital rights in, in Africa, um, if you could talk us through the state of encryption, both in terms of policies and in threats um, across the continent. And crucially as well as about some of the research here, I know your team have done on this. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Zo. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which uh, time zone we are operating on. Um, yes, my name is uh, Lilian Naroga. I work with Sifesa. Um, Sifesa can be quite a mouthful, but uh, I'll break it down uh, for you. Sifesa is the collaboration on international ICT policy in East and Southern Africa. We are based in Kampala, Uganda. And uh, we work across the region, not necessarily East and Southern Africa, but we also focus on other countries on the continent. Mainly um, our work focuses on um, research, um, uh, knowledge transfer, capacity building on different uh, uh, internet or digital related um, areas. Uh, Focusing on digital rights is one of the aspects. And we also have other programs, but everything nowadays rotates around digital rights. Um, our work on uh, encryption in, uh, in Africa and perhaps some of the growing concerns uh, we've seen, one is um, some of this uh, column has already mentioned, uh, but uh, just bring them closer to home is one is, um, We've seen a lot of legislation and re regulations that are prohibitive. Uh, you know, they, they, they hamper the use of uh, encryption. And uh, many of these laws do require registration and licensing of encryption service providers. And also we've seen that they give regulators um, extensive powers to prohibit the use of you know, uh, some encryption technologies. Um, so for someone to be able to offer uh, encryption, one is without a license, there are hefty um, kind of penalties that, you know, this uh, kind of service provider, you know, attracts. And uh, also there's been also um, condemnation of, you know, failure to handle over uh, secret encryption codes to state authorities, or even, you know, using prohib uh, prohibitive uh, encryption tools. Uh, legislations we've seen um, across the continent also um, are in countries like Benin, Chad, Cameroon, Congo, Brazzaville, uh, DR Congo, uh, Ethiopia, Guinea, Ivory Coast, Malawi, uh, Morocco, Senegal, South Africa, Tanzania, Tunisia, Zambia, 
among us, you know, so many others. And there is really no kind of, uh, in some of uh, these countries, there's no specific legislation that is coming out to say, this is the law on encryption, but the legislation is kind of, you know, hidden in other, you know, um, uh, legislations that are around, you know, um, use of, you know, technology, like say, we have laws that, uh, you know, uh, promote the use of um, uh, surveillance, you know, I think already Callum has already mentioned that we have legislations that, you know, uh, on interception of communications, you know, across the continent and, you know, they compel service providers to um, offer assistance, you know, to state actors or law enforcement in, you know, conducting surveillance. Whereas this may not be that a huge concern for purposes of, you know, the obvious reasons, uh, fighting crime, security, and the like, we are seeing that these are being abused. Um, and also where you see in states or in countries where um, democracy is not um, a top priority in some of these countries, these you know, um, legislations are being used to target uh, human rights defenders, uh, activists or you know, uh, opposition, uh, you know, people who are in the opposition, um, among others. Uh, others. So um, countries where you know, there are these uh, kind of interception of communication laws that have um, great concerns on you know, uh, mechanisms that you know, require to install software, you know, um, to facilitate, you know, the interception. We've seen countries like, of course, Uganda, <laughs> Rwanda, Senegal, Zambia, Togo, Tunisia, um, Malawi, the list is endless, and Zimbabwe. Um, the other thing that is more or less related to the interception of communications uh, and also related to encryption is the mandatory SIM card um, registration, which is in one way, um, meant to you know collect data and be able to monitor and you know be able to you know um, require you know some of you know the service providers to be able to get real time you know communication so some of these things um, in the mandatory SIM card there's a lot of data that's being collected so in countries where you're seeing that uh, um, uh, voices you know uh, uh, that are critical of government you have requirements, you know, your location, your national ID, um, national ID, which national ID requires, you know, you to take, you know, biometric data, you know, they know where you stay, your parents, your next of kin, and all that. It becomes hard, you know, when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, these actors using uh, encryption. Um, mainly, I would like to highlight uh, Zimbabwe, uh, which has uh, the Inter Interception of Communications Act, which requires Cryptogra uh, cryptography services providers to decrypt data at judicial authorities' request or provide them with a code that allow the encryption of data that they've encrypted. So this permits the security agents to demand that information, you know, that the information is decrypted before it is handed to them. And, you know, of course, with the whole, you know, um, uh, um, uh, reasons of national security or economic well-being, and this is particularly in this Interception of Communications Act for Zimbabwe. Um, the other countries uh, um, that I can uh, focus on, uh, maybe one of the other issues is saying that there's been an increase in data localization requirements, where um, also this is not really, there's no really specific law, but I think this requirement is being sneaked into uh, laws like the Data Protection Act, and uh, I think also the interception of communications. Um, this is a growing concern when it comes to data portability because one is just, it requires the data to be, you know, uh, stored locally. And again, where we are seeing that in countries where we, there is, Democracy is on the decline, you know, it, it, it doesn't exist. This is a very huge concern when it comes to, say, uh, protection of human rights defenders. Um, this applies to countries like Kenya, Malawi, Tunisia, Nigeria, Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, where data transfers must be authorized by the state. Um, 
The other, perhaps I can draw some cases, um, for instance, where we've seen uh, uh, people or human rights defenders and journalists being arrested uh, uh, because of, you know, uh, data that was, you know, them using encrypted data. We've seen cases in, in Rwanda where private communications of, you know, um, activists, uh, journalists were, you know, produced in court and these were WhatsApp, you know, communications. We've seen uh, governments going on, I think we all have heard about the Pegasus, you know, case where, you know, Rwanda, Morocco, um, which other African country that are actually using, you know, Pegasus, you know, to monitor on, you know, uh, people who are considered a threat to, you know, to the government. So Rwanda, there have been cases of, you know, opposition leaders being monitored, but also, you know, using uh, this particular software that has seen its way in encrypted services like WhatsApp being utilized to, you know, uh, monitor conversations of um, uh, politicians, you know, government officials across in other countries. The other example I can also give that we are seeing that uh, on the state of encryption in Africa is the ban on use of VPNs because where you know you you're able to communicate or whether you where you want to you know uh, circumvent or you know try to protect your privacy VPNs in Uganda for instance uh, we are banned uh, you know we still there's a list of um, of uh, VPNs that have been you know prohibited or banned and uh, this you know uh, poses a threat to those who are really critical of the state. Um, the other example perhaps I can uh, throw a highlight uh, is Zimbabwe, which I think by te uh, the telecom uh, operator Econet Wireless, when it introduced a BlackBerry message service, you know, BlackBerry, I think, does offer, you know, encrypted messaging. So this, according to the authorities, you know, in uh, Zimbabwe, they argued that, you know, it contravenes the country's, you know, interception of communications law, which bars provision of, you know, services with a that the regulator cannot, you know, intercept. Um, all this, uh, we've seen also that uh, at a continental level, there have been actors, or we are seeing actors taking a strong focus on, you know, promoting for encryption. For instance, we've seen the Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression and access to information in Africa, that is at the Africa Commission on uh, Human Rights and People's Rights, uh, which provides that you know, states should not adopt laws or other measures that prohibit or weaken encryption, including you know, backdoors uh, and data localization requirements, unless such measures are justifiable and compatible with international human rights laws and standards. And from what Kalomos has just shared, I think what is happening, what we are seeing currently in Africa kind of contravenes, you know, this um, regional uh, framework or regional, you know, principle that uh, is talking about encryption. So mm -hmm. away from that, <laughs> I don't know, uh, yes, I don't know if I need to summarize, but yeah, away no, from I, that. <laughs> I was going to say, I um, you actually really nicely introduced the, the point, Lily, about, um, you know, Pegasus and, and what all this means for, for journalists. And I want to come back to you in a bit on, you know, what you said about legislation, and you've mentioned Benin, Cameroon, Ethiopia, and, and many others where you may not necessarily have specific legislation on encryption, um, but how, you know, countries promoting the use of, of surveillance or interception of communication laws can then, of course, be, be used to weaken encryption. So I'm going to come back to you in a minute on that and, and this rise of um, so-called digital authoritarianism across the continent and, and how concerned you are about that. I just want to, to the point you introduced about journalists, um, come to Scott for a second and, and the work that he and his team do at the International Press Institute. Scott, could you tell us a little bit about what threats to encryption mean for journalists and, and their work in particular? Um, and of course, the broader implications for, for press freedom and, and digital rights. Sure, uh, thanks so much, uh, Zoe, and uh, good afternoon, good morning to everyone. It's uh, great to, to be here. Thanks a lot for, for having me and, and for inviting IPI to this discussion. Uh, just also by, as a way of introduction, IPI is a global press freedom organization. We're a network of, of publishers and editors and leading journalists uh, defending press freedom actually since, since 1950. Um, and encryption is, is, is such an important issue to a lot of different groups. Uh, you know, it's a privacy issue and a security issue um, for the public, actually, but you know, of course, in particular for, for vulnerable groups, for minority groups, uh, but it's definitely also an issue uh, for 
journalism. And IPI has been increasingly focusing on the threat uh, to encryption, especially the end-to-end -end encryption, uh, as a fundamental threat to, to press freedom. Uh, and, and we're not alone in that. I think you know, many uh, press freedom and journalism groups uh, understand that the right to encryption is essential, basically, for doing journalistic work uh, in the digital age. Um, and I think that, you know, as with every press freedom topic, it's never about just the impact on the individual journalist or media outlet, uh, but because of the role that journalists play in democracy and providing public interest news and information, um, it's something that affects society at large, ultimately, uh, all of us. Um, and, and just, you know, in, in preparing for this panel, uh, speaking again with, you know, um, you know, different members of the IPI community, mainly investigative journalists, um, and, and basically these conversations reinforce what we already knew, which is that uh, encryption, and again, especially end-to-end -end encryption is essential to journalists' work nowadays. Uh, it, it's, it's central to their being able to do their jobs. It's part of their, their journalistic regimen, and it's a crucial element of, of security protocols. Uh, journalists depend on it to, to communicate securely, um, you know, to communicate with their sources, of course, uh, but also to communicate with, with one another and within the newsroom. Um, and certainly I would say there are two groups for whom this is especially uh, the case. One is uh, investigative journalists everywhere who have a particularly high degree of need to communicate confidenti confidentially and securely and need to take extra steps to protect their sources. Uh, but you also have uh, you know, journalists working in uh, repressive regimes uh, who may be targeted uh, for surveillance. Um, and the flip side to this, you know, this degree of importance is obviously that, you know, threats to encryption are therefore a threat to journalists being able to do their jobs. Um, and I think that you can look at it definitely from, you know, there is the angle of source protection in the narrow, sort of in the narrow sense. Uh, and by that, I mean that obviously encryption, again, really speaking here about end-to-end -end encryption, um, as being the strongest version, helps protect the identities of sources of journalistic work uh, and the information being provided, um, but, but also the, this sort of wider angle of, of surveillance. You know, encryption is a tool, it's not a silver bullet. It doesn't provide perfect protection against surveillance, uh, but it is a very important tool to guard against uh, unwanted surveillance by the state, by other actors, um, you know, it protects the confidentiality of our digital conversations and digital transfer and storage of data uh, and, and sort of the conversations that journalists need to do their work, again, whether with sources or among one another in the newsroom. Um, and as, as Callum, you know, had this example of the postcard, uh, you know, not using encryption really lays bare our communications and puts it out there for, for anyone to see uh, and with all of the risks that come with that. Uh, for journalists, uh, you know, you have uh, the risk of censorship that non-encrypted communication uh, could be subject to a censorship regime that certain words, phrases, ideas are forcibly filtered out. Uh, you have the risk that journalistic investigations will be obstructed, prevented, manipulated. Uh, the risk then that both journalists and their sources uh, may face harassment, uh, legal harassment, they may face physical endangerment, so actually threats to their physical integrity. And then, of course, more broadly, you have, and I think this is also should be, you know, we shouldn't forget that there is a risk of self-censorship uh, and a chilling effect. Um, as with any topic related to, to surveillance, you know, the, the, the knowledge that, uh, you know, you are under surveillance or the assumption that you may be under surveillance um, absolutely has the potential to put journalists off from doing their job, sort of this this um, this idea of being under the constant roving eye of the state, um, you know, can affect journalists' willingness to collect and disseminate uh, news. Um, and just actually, just a short quote from uh, the end of October: the Indian Supreme Court ruled that yeah, ordered the uh, ordered an investigative committee to look into the use of Pegasus, which is, uh, I think, a, a topic we absolutely cannot uh, miss in this in this discussion. So we may come back to that a little bit, but. Uh, ordered a committee to look into the abuse of, of Pegasus, and they said in the ruling that you know it's undeniable that surveillance and the knowledge that one is under the threat of being spied on can affect the way an individual decides to exercise his or her rights. Such a scenario might result in self-censorship, and this is a particular concern when it relates to 
freedom of the press, uh, which is an important pillar of democracy. So end quote there. And, and the point is just that, again, you know, the, 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 the fact of being under surveillance or, or the perception that one is under surveillance for journalists definitely has an impact on how we exercise uh, fundamental rights and whether we exercise fundamental rights, in this case, uh, the rights to free expression and press freedom. You know, and, and that may not be the case for all journalists. Uh, you know, the chilling effect may not apply to everyone, uh, but the fact that it exists or the fact that it may cause this chilling effect on some journalists is, is problematic enough, obviously. Um, and just, you know, when we think about, from, from IPI's point of view, when we think about the issue of encryption, um, I think it's really uh, important to keep the, this wider context in view. Um, and, and by that, I mean a couple of different things. So one is that, as, as Callum already mentioned, there's no technical solution to breaking encryption for one purpose and leaving it intact for, for other purposes. Um, and so when you, when you, you know, create these back doors, uh, you essentially sort of open a kind of Pandora's box uh, that, you know, the, the sort of putting weaknesses into encryption weakens it for everyone, not just for sort of the stated purpose or whatever the state is trying to accomplish, but it opens it up to criminals as well. Um, and, you know, wittingly or unwittingly then lends itself to being abused uh, for purposes that go far beyond whatever the original uh, intention was. Um, and the second thing I think that we need to take into account is, is whose perspective are we, are, we, are we talking about? You know, uh, you know, I was talking to a journalist in Australia earlier who was saying, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a sense of futility when we talk about it, you know, encryption and to an encryption because we know that you know, the government is regularly giving itself new tools uh, with which to you know, look into encrypted communications. So you know, there's a little bit of this futility uh, sense of futility, however, not necessarily an immediate threat. Uh, or, you know, we, we may have journalists who say, yeah, this is, um, you know, the idea that it could be under surveillance or that end-to-end -end encryption may be somehow circumvented uh, is, uh, is, is an annoyance maybe, but again, not necessarily an immediate threat. Um, and, and the point I think is that, you know, you may not consider encryption or breaking encryption to be a threat to you, even as a journalist, uh, but for journalists to work in high-risk environments, who work in under oppressive regimes, uh, encryption is, is not a convenience. Uh, it's actually an essential safety measure, uh, something that can protect your physical integrity, even your life, um, as well as the physical integrity and, and potentially life of your source. Um, and then just connected to that, you know, again, we, I think it's, we, we can't confine these discussions about encryption policy uh, to one state uh, or another. Um, we know that states borrow and copy uh, these types of policies when, in, you know, when it comes to digital censorship or in the digital sphere, um, they, they, you know, borrow ideas from, if you want, democratic states uh, and use them as, as ammunition for their own efforts, which have nothing to do with even striking any kind of even pretend balance between security and freedom of expression and everything to do with silencing dissidents and, and controlling information. So absolutely, when we talk about uh, encryption policy and weakening encryption, uh, it's, it's incredibly important to keep in mind the impact uh, that this has on press freedom, on free expression, on our right to, to news and information. Um, and just coming back to something that the Cameron said as well about the justifications that governments are using uh, to weaken encryption. Um, absolutely, I completely agree that it's the role, also the role of media to scrutinize these. And, and I think we all know that, you know, Things like you know, the fight against terrorism has been used as an excuse to weaken lots of fundamental rights around the world. Um, you know, now there's a lot of talk about uh, child sexual abuse material as, as, a, as a way of, uh, well, as a reason to, to weaken encryption. Um, and I think that, yeah, th these things need to be discussed, they need to be scrutinized, they need to be looked into, and obviously the media plays a very important role in doing that and understanding, you know, what are the actual trade-offs is there, you know, is there really this diametric opposition between these two issues that we're discussing? And really just to, again, to, to scrutinize that. Um, and, and finally, again, I think that hopefully we'll get a chance also, also to talk about, I mean, we're talking a little bit about sort of technical efforts to make encryption, but I think that things like Pegasus, for example, are ways of circumventing encryp encryption, or at least the purpose of what encryption is supposed to do. Uh, and I think that these are also, um, you know, critical, uh, 
critical points that should be discussed as part of this debate. So I'll leave it there uh, for now and, and looking forward to continuing this conversation. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. I think you, you make a crucial point about, you know, the right to encryption being essential uh, for doing journalistic work, of course, and but that having an impact not just on, on the journalist as an individual, but society at large, um, because of the role, of course, that journalists play in, in finding and, and sharing accurate and reliable information, um, which, as we've seen throughout this, this conference, and we'll continue to do so later today, is, is one of the cornerstones of, of democracy. Um, and I note that you've all touched as well on the, um, you know, there being no kind of technical solution to, to breaking encryption for, for one purpose and, and leaving it intact for, for another purpose. So we'll, we'll come back to that shortly and, and to backdoors, the idea of backdoors in particular. Um, for now, I want to stay for a little bit on the human impact of, of these threats to encryption, because I, I think that's really what brings the issue home for, for our audience. Um, Callum, you've, you've explained to us how, you know, threats against encryption has impacts for everyday lives using the analogy of the very good analogy of the postcard. Could you talk us and, and through some of your work in internet society, um, where in which specific countries some of these threats are emerging, but also give examples of specific communities that, that may be at risk? Um, I know you've mentioned before um, LGBT plus groups, for example. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, you know, uh, I think the LGBT community, LGBTQ community, um, you know, it's something that I obviously hold very close um, as a member of the community, but it's also something that the Internet Society has been thinking about uh, for some time as far as it intersects with, uh, intersects with encryption. So last year we worked with an organization called LGBT Tech to publish a fact sheet on how the community actually relies on encryption. Um, I think the first and most obvious thing that comes to people's mind when they think of encryption in the LGB, <clears throat> sorry, LGBTQ community is physical safety. So there are 69 countries around the world that criminalize homosexuality in some shape or form. This can result in, you know, imprisonment, flogging, fines, and in six of the countries, it is actually the, the death sentence. Um, so in countries like these, where the state is the perpetrator of the violence and discrimination against the LGBTQ community, encryption is an essential tool for keeping people safe. Um, you know, uh, with encryption, people can safely connect with their community, find love and access support uh, resources with the knowledge that they won't face unjust uh, criminal charges. But one thing I want to emphasize is that encryption is important for the LGBTQ community, even in countries where state-sponsored discrimination is not the core threat. Um, so as we all know, the LGBTQ community is heavily stigmatized uh, around the world, um, and even in the most uh, progressive countries, individuals still uh, depend on encryption for protection, just in a different sense of the word. Um, so encryption is used by individuals to safely come out of the closet at their, at their own pace, you know, to connect with like-minded people safely, to avoid discrimination at work, and to access resources such as counseling, as well as additionally to uh, protect uh, individuals that may be in non-supportive families or, or communities. Um, another thing, you know, technologies that, that the LGBTQ community also disproportionately suffers from stigmatized diseases such as HIV, so individuals rely on encryption to seek medical help with a guarantee that their medical records and conversations will stay confidential. Um, and then finally, throughout the world, the trans community continues to face really high rates of violence and murder. So for them, encryption is uh, used to save lives and protect, protect against uh, hate crimes. Um, you know, just so to kind of sum it up, uh, encryption definitely has a duality for the LGBTQ community. It's very much connected to physical safety um, from violence or from discrimination. But at the same time, it is connected to privacy and it does empower people to live their lives fully um, without fear of kind of retaliation or, or, con or those different consequences. Um, and, you know, we probably won't have time to get into it too much today, but I know that there are quite a few, you know, members from civil society listening in, in the audience today. And I would just mention that the LGBTQ community is, you know, just one of many kind of vulnerable groups that really does rely on encryption. Uh, you know, encryption is also important for the victims of abuse um, and, you know, for minority groups that are also excluded from society in different ways, such as, you know, ethnic and religious groups or refugees or, or other kinds of uh, groups of people. So, um, you know, I think it's just important to acknowledge that all of these communities do really rely on encryption. And when you're looking at that intersection of uh, different countries where legislation is coming in, limiting en encryption, sometimes these might also overlap with countries that have discriminatory policies when it comes to different minority or groups or vulnerable groups. So we just need to be very aware of how these things could come together and the harm that that could result in. Thank you, Callum, for that. I think that's that's a really crucial point here in terms of, you know, what 
threats to inscription mean for the, the physical safety of, of the LGBTQ community, but um, I note what you say as well about that also being the case in, in countries where um, even state-sponsored discrimination may not be the norm. And of course, the knock-on effects this has on, on other impacts of, of their lives, for example, kind of safely and confidentially seeking treatment for, for off-stigmatized diseases. Um, Lillian, I want to come back to what you were touching on earlier about, um, you know, this, this rise of laws across the African continent to be, um, you know, to kind of curtail freedom of expression um, and increase kind of state surveillance. Are you kind of concerned about this, you know, spreading to other countries? And do you think in some ways the coronavirus pandemic may have provided a, a cover for, for this type of um, legislation, even if, as you mentioned, it may not specific, specifically kind of mention encryption, but ultimately may be used to curtail um, encryption. Do you think that trend is kind of set to continue and, and has the pandemic made that any worse? Um, thanks, uh, Zo. Yes, uh, I think uh, like we've already seen what the pandemic, you know, has thrown uh, um, light or shed a light on the importance of technology, but we've also seen there's been an increase in violations, you know, of uh, digital rights um, on the continent, you know, either, either, you know, through issues of, you know, surveillance, contact tracing. We've seen uh, intrusive, you know, uh, mechanisms that, you know, states is taking without really taking into perspective, you know, uh, the rights to privacy of, you know, individuals, all in the name of, you know, contract tracing. We've also seen uh, in, uh, in Africa more especially that uh, we, there are countries that uh, given their undemocratic nature, they still went ahead to hold, you know, uh, important, um, important governance, you know, uh, uh, assemblies like say holding elections, campaigning and that kind of thing. And uh, in Uganda, more specifically, we saw that, you know, in the face of, you know, elections, we had, you know, this network disruptions and, you know, the whole, you know, ban on VPNs. This really had a chilling effect on, you know, democratic participation. And uh, some of the work that we've been doing around this is we've been documenting not just the state of encryption, but you know, all the things that you know connect the dots to the set of digital rights, you know, in Africa, whether it is through documenting uh, um, legislation that is coming up that requires, for instance, uh, say Tanzania, they have uh, current amendments ongoing to review their um, uh, electronic uh, uh, post uh, regulations, you know, around you know, uh, social media. And also they do require, um, for instance, uh, internet cafes or, you know, places, well, internet cafes, uh, you know, to be uh, record and, you know, maintain, you know, a specific list of, you know, people who have accessed this and who are more so what they are doing. Um, this, for me, I think is not going to end. And um, just has caught as, you know, highlighted and mainly say if it comes to freedom of expression, not just journalists or, you know, the LGBTQI community, but we are also seeing, you know, political, you know, the sense, you know, people who are activists who are critical. A key example, I think we've all heard about the Zone 9, uh, Zone 9 um, bloggers in, uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, rather in Ethiopia, who were actually um, detained and prosecuted for using encryption, you know, communications. And uh, much as uh, this is in Ethiopia, much as, you know, uh, with the change of government, we saw, you know, them being released, but it doesn't mean that the practice has ended. So we are seeing, especially here, we are seeing that there's a cut and paste or, you know, copycat, like, you know, if one country gets away with doing something, then the other country will be able to also do that. So what we are trying to do is create awareness on one, not just you know, the state, the overall broad rights on digital rights, but also try to specifically go into these issues like say surveillance, right to expression, anonymity, encryption, because all these are kind of interlinked. Trying to engage with human rights defenders, organizations that are working um, specifically on, you know, whether it is a democracy, uh, 
uh, democracy uh, monitoring, whether it is um, freedom of expression, media-based organizations, whether it is the LGBTQI communities, we are working with them to provide them, you know, um, with trainings or with knowledge on how to safely, you know, communicate and, you know, uh, and utilize, you know, technology in a way that, you know, they can feel safe. And of course, you know, using uh, encryption, uh, going into specific, you know, how to use VPNs, how to create secure passwords is one of the aspects that we look into, but also creating an understanding on what does the law say in case, you know, your quote, what does the law say and how can you uh, kind of, you know, um, engage, you know, get the best, you know, legal services uh, around that. So we are seeing that, yes, this is a trend. And of course, the pandemic has just shed more light or even made it worse for people who are working around, you know, promoting or advancing this kind of, you know, conversations or this kind of issues, because then it be, you, we become a target, you know, we, we become a target. And uh, with the loss of the violations, especially with the surveillance and contact tracing, this is bound to, you know, to keep increasing. But again, I think that is where we are here in conferences like this, and also, you know, uh, working with organizations like the Internet Society, who uh, we just went into partnership on with on how to, you know, create, you know, uh, shed more light on encryption in Africa and how to, you know, bring state uh, actors and, you know, private sectors and other, you know, actors like human rights defenders to get to know, you know, the importance of encryption and why it needs to be protected. Thanks, Lenina. I think that's such a valid point that you make about the, you know, cut and paste and copycat effect of, of these abuses of encryption and, and privacy and how if one country sees another getting away with it, um, that of course creates fertile ground for that legislation or, or abuse to be tested and, and replicated elsewhere. Um, I want to come back to something Scott mentioned earlier. Um, you touched on the Pegasus scandal, which uh, just as a reminder to, to our audience, um, this was the investigation, of course, that broke earlier this year by several media organizations um, that found that spyware by uh, the Israeli NSO group was, was used basically in um, attempted and successful hacks of phones belonging to, to journalists, um, officials, and, and kind of rights activists. Scott, what do you think that recent events like, um, you know, the Pegasus scandal, I'm thinking also of um, China blocking um, Signal uh, earlier this year, what do those kind of recent developments mean for vulnerable communities? And are there any recent cases you can think of, um, of you know, other cases of, of the press being subject to, to hacking and, and surveillance by government entities? Yeah, thanks. I mean, the, the, the Pegasus revelations, I think, set a shockwave through uh, the journalistic community. I don't think that anyone was fully aware of the extent to which uh, the spyware technology was being deployed against journalists, not only in uh, you know, countries which are which are widely perceived to be authoritarian, but also sort of in semi uh, semi authoritarian or illiberal, illiberal countries like Hungary, it was a shock to see that that this was going on. Um, and you know, the, the threat is is really pernicious from Pegasus in part because of the totality of what the spyware can do. That it can you know, access basically everything on the device, including you know microphones, cameras, also information sent by a signal and WhatsApp. Uh, but also because of the, the, the difficulty of detecting it. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, IPI is, is, is among, you know, and within the press freedom community, all of us are pushing for accountability uh, for this abuse of Pegasus and for, uh, for consequences for the NSO group. And we've seen a little bit of that so far, uh, which are some good developments, but, but more needs to happen. Um, and, you know, I think it just shows uh, the extent to which governments are <laughs> bent on surveilling their perceived opponents, which in many cases are journalists who are just doing their job of, uh, you know, researching and publishing information, critical information sometimes about states uh, and states who see that, uh, that essential work as a threat uh, are, are turning to, to technologies and spiral like Pegasus. Uh, and it's, again, it's not, I think it's a, it's a serious, serious threat to press freedom. Uh, and I think many groups are, are working to, to push for that accountability. Um, but I would say that, and this is something that came up a lot in, in the conversations I had with journalists and thinking about this panel was, you know, how does this impact uh, your thinking about surveillance? And, and the response was pretty much unanimous to say that, look, we know that, uh, for example, end-to-end -end encryption is not a magic 
wand or, or silver bullet that gives us complete protection. We understand that, that we could still you know, face uh, attacks by spyware like Pegasus. Uh, however, it doesn't um, negate the benefits of end-to-end of -end encryption. I think that's a really important point to make that just because this type of spyware exists doesn't mean that we don't get those benefits from encryption. We do, most journalists uh, will not be targeted by, uh, by, by Pegasus, thank goodness. Uh, and, and those that will, we can expect a strong response and call for accountability. So uh, let's, not, uh, let's not miss that, you know, that, that encryption still offers enormous benefits uh, to everyone and we should keep that, we should keep that in mind. Um, but yes, we, we do see growing efforts by states to turn to these types of, of devices, uh, these types of instruments. Uh, it's, it's very troubling. Um, and you, know, you mentioned, of course, China and, and, and blocking signal. Uh, you know, one of the last ways for people to, to communicate by encrypted means uh, there. Um, but I fear that probably won't be the last. And we also, again, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier, that we also see, again, it's not just non-democratic countries that are trying to weaken encryption or, uh, you know, uh, in institute new forms of, of surveillance. And you do see that when this does occur in, in countries that are considered to, to be democratic countries are considered to have strong uh, functioning rule of law, uh, it, there is a domino effect, you know, there is this, this idea that it will uh, inspire and influence uh, non-democratic states, repressive regimes, uh, that will borrow those ideas without any sort of semblance of uh, protection for fundamental rights that you might find uh, in some democratic countries. And, and that's, a, that's a real issue. And I think it's something that we can't, as I said before, we can't just wall off this discussion and say, okay, you know, we have this sort of regime for weakening encryption in the UK or Australia and expect it not to have an impact on other parts of the world, it will. Um, so, so we really need to keep that uh, in mind as well. Thanks, Scott. I think that's that's an important caveat that, you know, as you say, end-to-end -end encryption is, of course, no silver bullet to, to circumvent surveillance, which, which of course does not negate its benefits. Um, and then a useful reminder to, to us all, as you mentioned, that it's, um, and as Lillian has also said, that it's not just non-democratic countries trying to, to weaken encryption, um, but that, that kind of domino effect that you've all mentioned. I want to, to finish this kind of conversation, and um, I'll, I'll try to finish some time, but to keep this conversation as, as constructive and kind of tangible as possible, um, discuss any possible alternative solutions um, the, the panel sees that, that do not weaken encryption. Um, what really is, is the solution to this, and increasingly this type of, of legislation being passed by governments? Um, Callum, perhaps starting with you. Yeah, sure. Uh, happy, happy to chime in. So I think when it comes to solutions, <clears throat> you know, most people would agree with the intent of a lot of the legislation that has been coming out, you know, that certain content is harmful for our societies. I think the disagreement comes in obviously on the approach, you know, removing encryption is extremely invasive. Um, and then trying to address one type of harm, the legislation opens up society to a whole new array of uh, harms. So the real concern then is, uh, you know, the question that comes naturally is, uh, what are the alternatives that exist? So uh, there are a number of technical options uh, that law enforcement agencies could uh, make better use of. These are existing technical options. Um, so I'll, I'll outline a few of them. But the first one I'd mention is actually metadata analysis. So uh, encrypted messages still leave behind um, some limited information, information such as the volume or the size of the messages sent from a particular account, or in some cases, even the, the profile picture. Um, and machine learning can actually be applied to metadata to, the, to better predict the sharing of problem content. And so we've actually seen this um, application used in a few cases. One would be WhatsApp. They already use this approach and they identify over 300,000 accounts per month uh, suspected of sharing child sexual abuse material. Um, you know, uh, metadata analysis, one thing to note is that it would ne likely need to occur on our user devices. That's where that's where most metadata is typically stored. Uh, but having said that, this is an approach that could be very effective in identifying the accounts that do the heavy lifting of really amplifying illegal content and getting out to very, very large audiences. Uh, so that's the first. Um, the second one I would mention uh, uh, would be to reduce friction for user reporting of uh, harmful content. So for example, law enforcement agencies could establish dedicated reporting channels uh, where content can be reported, or meanwhile, service providers could streamline reporting and the user experience to make it easier for users to report. So, you know, that there's less friction and it's, it's very kind of uh, easy to flag stuff. Um, you know, in the case of end-to-end -end encryption, the recipient could flag content to law enforcement agents and identify the sender of the said content voluntarily. The technical term for this is, it's called message, uh, message franking. Um, this isn't considered a violation of encryption, 
uh, as one of the original parties is volunteering this information, you know, you know at their own will. Um, but it is important to note that that wouldn't work for all end-to-end -end encryption uh, providers, uh, as some of them see message franking as a violation of um, deniability, which they see as a component of privacy. So that could maybe work in, with some providers, but not all. Um, the third, it's very simple, but kind of analog police work, you know, going back to traditional techniques. Um, one thing that really sticks with me is that we've heard law uh, enforcement agents themselves admit that breaking encryption probably would not actually help much in catching sophisticated criminals. Uh, those sophisticated criminals would probably just move to alternative non-commercial encryption systems. So, uh, you know, instead weakening encryption, I think law enforcement agents, they, they envision it as a tool to catch the unsophisticated criminal, if that makes sense. Um, so if that really is the case, I think uh, it would be appropriate to exhaust traditional kind of police techniques um, before uh, going resorting to a method that breaks, you know, security and privacy for all of us. And then the fourth and final one I would mention, uh, we've already talked about it, Scott's mentioned it, um, we have to acknowledge that hacking already happens a lot. Um, you know, governments, uh, maybe a lot is an exaggeration, governments do do, do this, um, and it comes with its own uh, kind of need for safeguards and discussions about vulnerability disclosures in the hacking market, um, but it, it is something that is occurring and law enforcement is using this tool already. Um, so those are the four that I would, I would highlight, uh, I think, more research is needed on these topics, especially the first two, these technical options, um, and funding is also needed for that research as well. So that's somewhere where governments might actually take a very proactive and uh, positive role in, in pushing that kind of um, innovation forward. Thanks, Callum. Some really useful examples there from kind of metadata analysis, um, you have mentioned reducing, making it easier for, for users to report harmful content, um, and of course, analog police work. And I think that's an interesting point that often, you know, efforts to weaken um, encryption do not necessarily lead um, or do not necessarily make it easier to kind of capture criminals. And, and we've seen this through, um, you know, many journalists work on um, uh, trafficking and, and modern slavery, for example, with including our team here at TRF, where very often the, the criminals are, are ahead of, of law enforcement in terms of, of their use of these technologies. Um, so being mindful of that. Lillian, just coming back to you for a final point, are you seeing use of any of these kind of solutions or other solutions or technologies for encrypted storage or communications um, in any countries in, in Africa? And do you think they hold any promise to, to some of these threats? Uh, thanks. I think uh, Carlon has mentioned most of the, you know, the solutions, but uh, one thing is, uh, one is they are two, we have to face the reality that, you know, we are living in a digital world, you know, everything is, uh, uh, sophisticated, uh, you know, criminals are sophisticated and, you know, uh, um, a ban, you know, a, you know, blunted ban on encryption is not something that, you know, should really be focused on by, by governments. But we've also seen that also, you know, um, where there's surveillance, the, you know, there are uh, profound, you know, uh, impacts, you know, on people's personal lives and relations. Uh, you know, their overall well-being. And one is that uh, we need to be able, people, the internet was created, you know, for everyone to be able to enjoy to the fullest. So when someone um, feels insecure to communicate just to, you know, utter out something or, you know, share information within, you know, an enclosed group, then there we are having, you know, we are, we are going to see a problem where in countries where people are just getting online and they are having this kind of hindrances uh, that are actually done, you know, out of, uh, um, out of, you know, respect for the fundamental human rights and where, where there's really not enough justification for use of, you say, surveillance tools or, you know, ban on uh, um, encryption, you know, uh, software and that kind of thing, then we are going to still have this global digital divide that we are, you know, trying to uh, to bridge. So um, for me, the final word of question would be, yes, um, there are aspects that, you know, there could be some uh, limitation on, uh, say, encryption, but if it is to be done, then it has to be done in a manner that is applicable to international human rights standards. And there has to be really probable cause that, you know, there is actually something that is going to, there's a crime that is being committed. But again, like we've heard from the experts, Callum here, uh, you know, it, is, it doesn't really work that way. So I think uh, we need to acknowledge that these problems are there and uh, having conversations like this, getting together to find uh, workable solutions, then is something that we need to continue, you know, having.
Thank you. Thanks so much, Lillian. And, and very unfairly, leaving uh, 30 seconds to, to Scott, any promise, particular promise or um, hope you see in, in any of these solutions? As, uh, as I would just emphasize what, what, what Callum and also Lillian said is that when we, these are, you know, breaking encryption or weakening encryption is something very serious and very grave and has serious impacts on so many different groups. So when there are discussions about policies around it, we need to have this public debate, public dialogue. We need the media to scrutinize the arguments that are being put forward for it. Is it really going to do what governments tell us that it's going to do? Are we really, what benefits are we really going to get from that versus uh, the serious risks that come with it? Uh, so I just think that, that that is something that we absolutely have to have. Um, and, and again, the media plays such a key role in that. Thank you so much, Scott. Thanks to, to all of you. We've we've covered a lot of ground and, and I'm sure we could go on for hours, but I'm, I'm conscious of, of you and our audience's time. Um, thanks very much to, to our panelists, Callum, Lillian and Scott. Um, thank you, of course, to, to the Internet Society for their support um, and to you, the audience, for, for joining us. If you did have a question for any of the panelists, please do find us we're on, on Twitter. We're, we're all there. Um, but until then, thank you very much.